All right, uh, good evening. Uh, this is the uh, Mycological Association of Washington uh, meeting held online, which uh, I think I, I made the note rather cutely, we're calling the June Zoom, if you will. And so we're gonna, uh, I'll give you, a, the, the agenda for tonight is, uh, I'm gonna talk for just a little bit to just business where, we're, where we stand with a number of um, issues uh, that are club-wide without great uh, expanding on that. Um, I'm going to introduce the science advisor who's going to say a few words and then I'm going to introduce the newsletter editor uh, who is going to hopefully mention uh, the, what's in the newsletter again very briefly. Uh, and then I've got a couple of articles just to show that uh, that are interesting. I think that uh, and then we're going to go to a, a fungus uh, in the spotlight. We used to do fungus in focus and so that's a Bill Davis will do that. And then we're going to turn it over to Mitch and hopefully some of you have brought in uh, mushrooms because we're gonna actually the first time tonight try and do something like what we used what we did at the table um, and Mitch will talk about that so um, that's kind of the agenda so to start out um, we are progressing with our monthly meetings uh, we haven't yet quite figured out how to do uh, anything with culinary because it's just too difficult to you know locations and we're really held uh, until the library opens uh, to just decide whether they're gonna even allow groups in. And once we know that, then we can decide um, at some point uh, towards the, probably the end of the summer, we might wanna hold an outside meeting somewhere. Uh, I don't know, this, uh, those are kind of the options we're looking at. And then of course, as the fall opens up and mushrooms become more plentiful, we'll probably look at something at least think about doing an online foray like everybody goes out on their own and she gets together and shares something like that so that's kind of where we are with the overall uh game plan um so now i'm gonna uh as i mentioned turn it over just very briefly and introduce our new science advisor uh and that is uh, megan romberg uh who's a, a phd i believe in mycology but she's at the u.s so megan you want to uh, uh, uh Introduce yourself, and then I believe you wanted to make an announcement about the Mycological Society of America meeting. Yeah, hi, thanks, William. Um, yes, my name's Megan. Um, I, my PhD is actually in plant pathology because you cannot get a PhD in mycology anywhere in the US, nor can you get an undergraduate degree or a master's in mycology. So all mycological degrees are associated with something else. Um, I work for the USDA and spend, used to spend, most days looking at fungi, now I do that twice a week. Um, so um, like William said, I was gonna mention too, um, the Mycological Society of America, which is sort of the professional society, although everyone's welcome, um, is having a virtual meeting this summer. So it's one day, um, registration is $10, but you have to be a member and the associate membership price is $40. So it's a $50 cost if you're not a member. Um, and they're going to have a couple of interesting uh, talks. The first one is sort of a keynote talk on fluid dynamics of fungal mycelia. Um, and then the next talk is a woman, um, Ann Pringle. She was at Harvard, and I'm not sure where she is now, but she's going to be talking about lichens and whether they are individuals and sort of concept of individuals in fungi or organisms or ecosystems. Um, and then they're going to have a couple symposia, one on teaching mycology and one on um, fungal decay organisms. So if you have any interest, if you've ever wanted to go to an MSA meeting, this is your chance to go for um, $50 or maybe even 10 if you're a member. And I'm just gonna put in the website in the chat so people have it. Um, and that's all for me. Okay, thank you. Uh, and also I am now gonna segue to our known upcoming programs because it's interesting in one sense, our next speaker is gonna be the outgoing science advisor. Uh, Shannon Nix, uh, program to be announced as far as I know, not yet determined. Uh, she's uh, relocated to uh, up in New, New York, I believe. And of course, then following that in, in August will be Megan Stromberg, who's gonna talk about molds and rust. So we get one science advisor after another, which is a pretty good program schedule, for at least through the summer. And um, Tom, do you have any other uh, announcements about the programs that you'd like to make? Well, just that um, everything is still, uh, everything is, there's so much churn with programs at this point because of, uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, the only thing after 
Um, uh, so next month we have the outgoing science advisor. Um, Shannon Nix is going to speak to us the month after. We have our, we have our new science advisor, Megan Romberg. And the only other, Phil, uh, the only other sure lecture that I have booked at this time is in December, uh, William Davis is going to speak to us. Uh, he's, uh, he's giving us a short presentation on uh, Cisguides megalocarpus tonight. And in December, he's gonna, he'll be back to tell us about chytrid fungi. Uh, one of the potential benefits though of doing virtual meetings is it reduces all the burden of, of flying somebody in to talk to us in person. So uh, I think that there might be some, some potential to, to get some really marquee uh, mycologists to talk to us in the coming months. So that's it. Okay, I think that's a universal thing that people are discovering in all facets of uh, organizations, uh, societies, and also business practices, including most doctor's appointments, I think, at this point, though certainly psychiatry is that way. All right, so the, uh, in the social media realm where we are only able to occupy at this point, since physical space is restricted to people with masks six feet apart, which makes for a difficult meeting, uh, we do have a newsletter that came out uh, just this week, and it's uh, filled with uh, fascinating things that are possible activities that are for mycophilics or philiacs. I'm not sure if there even is a good name for who we may, may be, but uh, I'll now introduce our newsletter editor and social media coordinator, uh, Andy Green. Thanks, William. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yes, so the newsletter is out. Um, you should have received your electronic copy by now. And the uh, hard copies, if you've requested one, you should be getting them in the next uh, probably couple of days. I know they were, they were mailed out today, so you should be getting them soon. Um, and yes, as William mentioned inside the newsletter, um, I outlined a lot of the ways in which you know, mycophilia or us mycophiles. Yeah, I, I might have made up that word based on a rudimentary understanding of Latin, but um, you know, there's a lot of ways that we can still stay connected to um, our shared hobby, our shared interest, which is mushrooms. So of course, um, foraging is still a viable option in a lot of areas. You know, there's a lot of parks still open to the public and um, it's fairly easy to go foraging and go on a foray by yourself while maintaining a, a safe distance from others. and there's also a lot of ways that you can do at home activities. So I've been growing oyster mushrooms at home. It's been really fun. Uh, happy to answer any questions about that. Um, if anyone has questions, um, you can also, there's a lot of interesting, you know, fungal related books and movies that are out right now. So obviously fantastic fungi. We've been talking about a lot. Uh, you can rent or purchase that online um, and links to all these things I had mentioned in the newsletter. So um, for details of how to access these things, feel free to check out the newsletter. Um, so yes, there's at home mycological activities and also some fungi in the news. Uh, to me, the, the notable fungi in the news, um, I guess relevant to our area specifically, is that there's a petition circulating by a group called Decriminalize Nature DC. And if this petition reaches enough signatures, it would allow DC voters to vote in November on whether or not to decriminalize um, entheogenic or psychedelic uh, plants and fungi. So it's not on the ballot yet, but if this petition reaches enough signatures, it would be. So if that's of interest to you, um, you can check out the website Decriminalize Nature DC um, and for more information. Um, and yeah, as Tom mentioned, there's not too much in the newsletter as far as upcoming events, because we're not really sure exactly what's going on, but at least there's um, our, our upcoming speakers are for sure. So. And that's all for the newsletter. As far as the social media activities, uh, I really have to give credit to Tom Moore, who's been managing our Facebook page and doing an excellent job at it. So I think, I think he's here this evening. So thank you, thank you Tom, for, for, for your hard work and posting really interesting articles and having really interesting discussions with people. Um, if any of you are interested in staying connected with us um, online, as we are right now, um, but I'm on a more day-to-day -day basis, you can check out our, our Facebook page. There's a lot of really interesting resources on there and credit goes to Tom for that. So um, that's all I have, thanks. Okay, uh, any other board members uh, have anything to say? Just as one note that Bruce brought up the 
not surprisingly, the NAMA North American Mycological Association annual event is uh, canceled, postponed, whatever. This year, there will be one in 2021. More on that later. Uh, any other board member have any uh, thing they'd like me to or would like to say with regard to their own area that we haven't covered? I'll just jump in with meeting logistics. Um, everyone's on mute, which really helps so that we can hear the speaker. But um, there is a little chat window if you want to open it up. If you if you move your mouse, you'll see the the link for that at the bottom. Um, and in the last meeting, folks were having fun. Um, chatting a little bit during different speakers, but also it's a great way to, if you have questions for folks, um, if you put your questions in the chat window, we'll make sure we ask them at the, at the end of the talk. Okay, uh, in keeping with my preliminary uh, or tentative agenda, which we are following, I'm now gonna turn it over to uh, Bill Davis to talk about, uh, I won't even try to Sizigides Magalocarpus, that's probably as close as I'm going to get. So uh, I think he's got a presentation he's going to share. So um, Bill, you have the floor. You need to unmute if you haven't. Oh, I, can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me to talk about this uh, fungus. It's Zygites megalocarpus. Uh, it's a parasite on mushrooms, and <clears throat> so it's very common um, in here in North America where it's native to. And so just to orient us a little bit in the fungal tree of life, uh, this is Ascomycota and Basidiomycota. Uh, they are morels and brewer's yeast, button mushrooms, and the rust and smuts that Dr. Bruns talked about back in February. And Zygaides is here in Mucora mycota. And so these are a lot simpler fungi, and they can include things like rhizoclus, which you might find growing on your strawberries or on your bread. Zygaides grows on 98 different species of mushrooms. It appears as a whitish yellow or a grayish black beard hanging down from the cap. And it depends on the, the life stage. So the younger uh, is yellow or white, which is here on the, the left. And then the gray or black is the more mature stage, which is here on the right. It grows on 98 different species, but it most commonly grows on boletes and uh, agarics and uh, ammonitas. And it can take a variety of different forms. Uh, it can cover the entire mushroom like it does here. So it can be just a little bit of a patch. Sometimes it grows just from the gills, down from the gills, and sometimes it just grows on the cap of the mushroom. <clears throat> but it's fairly common from about June uh, into October and November. The part that you mostly see are the asexual sporangiospores. spores. And so these, like, if you look at them under a, like a hand lens or under a stereo microscope, uh, they dichotomously branch. They branch like a tree does. They start, they each terminally end in a uh, single sporangium, which has a single spore within it. And they start yellow and then they mature back to black as they age. And these are wind dispersed then. The yellow color is uh, due to the pigment beta keratin, which is also found in things like carrots, and is also the precursor molecule that's used to make the pigments in your eye. And Zygites itself can sense light, and it produces beta keratin in response to light. So what I have pictured here is a culture that uh, an undergraduate student that was working with me while I was at the University of Michigan was growing just out on the lab bench in the open light. And on the left, we took a picture of the plate with the lid on it. So you can see our label and everything. And then we took the lid off and the shadow cast by our label uh, was transferred onto the culture. So anywhere, so all the yellow is where the light was touching and then uh, where the writing was, there was no light and so it didn't turn yellow there. And Zygites uses this uh, as a way of measuring 
day length. And when the days get shorter, then it knows that it's winter is coming and it's time to start getting ready to overwinter. And it overwinters a, in a structure called a zygospore. And so I have pictured uh, zygospores here. And these are very resistant, they have very thick walls, and they're produced through sexual reproduction. And zygites was the first fungus in which sex was adequately described or observed, uh, and how we know that the uh, fungi actually are able to go through the sexual re reproduction. In the mucorrhalae, uh, sex is guided by the trisporic acid pathway. Now, this is a very complicated slide, and if you guys were my students, you would have to memorize this for the exam. But the main takeaway is that there are two different mating types. There's a, a plus mating type, which is on the left of the screen, and a minus mating type, which is on the right of the screen. And the plus mating type produces a compound, which is here in red, that is secreted into the environment. This is taken up by the minus, and it's converted into trisporic acid. And at the same time, the minus strain is producing a different compound, which is here in the orange box, that's secreted into the environment. And it's taken up by the plus strain, and then that is converted into trisporic acid. And when both strains are producing trisporic acid, they know that there's a compatible mating type there, and so they begin the process of having sexual reproduction then. This is a bit of a challenge for zygites because mushroom patches are um, patchy and they're ephemeral. So you, you might see it this week or today, next week it's gone. You might be, have a big patch on one side of a river uh, and then on the other side of the river next week. And for dispersing to this, it relies on its asexual spores, which are when dispersed and can travel very far distances but those asexual spores mean that all the offspring then are genetically identical, making it very hard to find a mate. So the question then becomes, well, how do you find a mate and make sure that you're able to produce zygospores to overwinter? And Zygites does this by having both mating types in the same genome. So one individual is both the plus strain and the minus strain. So if there is no other genetic individuals nearby, it just produces a clone of itself, puts it in the zygospore, and waits until next year. But it also has the ability to outcross. So if there is another genetic, uh, genetic individual, they'll undergo sexual reproduction, and then the following year, what's in the zygospore is not a clone, but the next generation. So Zygaes megacarpus is a very cool fungus. Uh, it grows on about 98 different species of mushrooms. It appears as a whitish yellow or a grayish black beard that hangs down from the cap. It uses daylight to tell when winter is coming and it overwinters the zygospores. And it contains both mating types in its genome to overcome the difficulties of finding a mate. So I, if we have time, uh, I will be happy to answer any questions and, and thank you guys for listening. Okay. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, just one question: What do you happen to know where the, the the genus name is really peculiar? Do you happen to know anything about the etymology of that? Uh, not offhand, no. I mean, I, somebody had to go out of their way to make up letters uh, in that order. It, it can't be. Uh, it's got to have some rationale, <laughs> other than making it even more frustrating for those of us who are not particularly uh, versed in either Latin or any other foreign language other than uh, an occasional word in French to try and figure out what the heck it means and to pronounce it also, which is a challenge. Okay. I'm not sure. Are there any other questions? All right, very interesting. Thank you very much. We'll look forward to hearing from you uh, later in the year for a longer presentation. So I, just in the area of uh, other um, media, uh, as you probably are aware of the fact, there's a, a magazine, Fungi Magazine, uh, that's, uh, if you don't get it, you might think about it. This one is on, uh, not surprisingly, con Contagion. Uh, you know, this is the era of Contagion. 
So uh, what's particularly interesting about this, this issue is it gives a timeline, I'll just show you here, of, of this sort of all of the fungal blights from the Irish potato famine to the American chestnut to the elm, all, just all of them going back in time, including this. Then there's an article on the Salem witch trials. Uh, and the, uh, you know, then this is the whole issue with the, um, uh, the Tom talked about before the Saint, uh, and Saint Anthony's fire and, and the, um, the LSD or it's really interesting, but, and no one's ever going to answer the question about the Salem witch trials, but it's an interesting take on the sort of the theory of that. And then the last thing I wanted to bring up, I did this last time. Because I mentioned it was the first time in Science Magazine I'd seen a full pay, a full article on fungi. Well, this issue, this is this one that just came out. That is a fungus on the cover, and not just any fungus. It is a, a wheat fungus that, uh, interestingly, is wheat is one of the few crops that does not have a, a GMO version, if you will, and this particular fungus uh, wipes out about 20% of all wheat. I wasn't aware of that. And uh, the article is about a genetic fix to that, that is a, a natural fix. Um, and it's a, something like a $5.6 billion a year loss to wheat farmers. And the article goes on to talk about all of the other genetic changes um, and where they are in our food system, uh, pointing out the 10% of the crops that are uh, of the arable land, I believe, is, is uh, planted with crops that have been modified. Uh, so remember, this is Science Magazine, and that's the business of genetically modifying is a matter of science. There are other issues that people have with that, but that's something you can think about on your own. This is not a political forum. It's a good article. I will send a copy to Tom. Uh, since I'm a subscriber as I did last time and you can make up your own decisions and your own mind about whether you think it's uh, something you want, want to, to learn about. So uh, it's now stump the chumps time. Uh, if any of you still remember click and clack, they went off the air some time ago, the reruns are still there. Uh, but I'd like to turn it over to our 4A chair who is actually in California. And if you got on early, you learned it was 1600 there. Uh, and that's not Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, that's the time. And so Mitch is going to at least have a go at explaining how we're going to uh, do this show and tell part. And we'll do this for if anybody has anything, obviously. We'll do it for a maximum of 15 minutes. Uh, and then we'll go ahead to our, our program. So Mitch, if you would uh, take the lead and uh, introduce what you intend to do and maybe what you plan to do for the future. Okay, sure, thanks and hey everybody. Hope you're doing all right. Um, so this is gonna be kind of weird because we can't get everybody's screen on one screen at once. Um, I believe there is a hand raising uh, feature that maybe we could have people raise their hands. Um, as William said, I'm not there, so I don't know what the weather's been like. I don't know what kind of mushrooms are up. Um, I've seen a few pictures people have been sending and asking about uh, Neolentinus uh, lepidus, which is a, a common uh, conifer rotting fungi. Uh, they call it the train wrecker because it would infect railroad ties and eat them away and, and alter the tracks and trains would veer off. So I guess today we could try a hand raise reaction or something along those lines. Elizabeth, do you have some sort of way to see who's raising hands? And then maybe we could unmute that person and uh, they could hold up the mushroom. So this is how we're gonna do it this time. I know this is a little um, ornery and kind of strange, but we'll try it this time. Uh, so. The next meeting, uh, I'll, what I'll do is I'll give kind of a little, you know, little instructions on what we can do on taking pictures. And maybe we could have, if you're going out walking in the woods and you see something that's cool, you could take a picture like as you're walking up to it. So you kind of see what kind of habitat it's growing in. 
then see if you could get a, uh, a close-up picture of the top, maybe, you know, with a bit of the, the stem in there, and then break a piece off so we could see the underside. And if you send it to forays at modec.com uh, or .org, I can see if I can compile this and maybe we could do this as a slideshow instead of a haphazard raise your hand or hold a, mu a mushroom up to the, the camera type thing. So anyway, any questions? Anybody have mushrooms today that you'd like to share? I see Matt and Rich. Why don't we do Matt? Because I already unmuted us. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, except uh, we can. We got Matt mushrooms in the background. The background. Yeah. Right. All right. So is that that looks like a gym studded puffball you got there? That's it. So that was um, a pot grown on wood, maybe on the ground. On the ground. Okay. Um, still grow on rotted wood sometimes. A lot of times you'll find them on the ground. Uh, very common. They have the little pyramidal little spines on the top that a lot of times can be rubbed off. So if it's been rainy and such, um, sometimes they may look smooth and they may look like pyroforme. So this is uh, gemata or uh, perlatum. I don't know what the what the main, what, what they've switched it to these days. Um, pyroforme are typically found on logs, can look similar. They tend to not have that large base on them. Um, so Matt's ripped it open there. You can see what they call the gleba and that's where the spores will have been, will be produced as they mature. It'll start turning to a yellow color. You can see that one looks very nice and white. So um, if you're planning on eating, a puffball, which they are oh, edible. Yeah. I wouldn't necessarily say tasty. Um, oh, that's and this one, this one was much softer on the outside, and you can see that it's it's forming its spores on the inside. It's not white. And so that's the spores maturing. It's turning that kind of greenish yellow color. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can see them. Can you see them? Yeah. <laughs> Pac-Man with an underbite. Yeah. Um, so, um, but yeah, so they are edible. It's good if you're new and you find puffballs to cut them because sometimes Amanita buttons may look like puffballs. And if you cut them, you'll see that little outline of a baby mushroom in there. Um, the the, the puffballs tend to be pure white. Sometimes you'll get kind of that mix or what you'll see where it's joining that sterile base and the gleba. But other than that, they're pretty distinctive and hard to misidentify. Anybody else? I don't have any mushrooms. It's very dry Renee, here. Renee has um, in, I, I'm in like San Jose and I, I'm, I think I saw some dried up polypores the other day, but that's about it. So Renee and Tom McCoy both have stuff. So why don't we do Renee next? Okay. I will um, do they need to speak to be shown? Like if they're not if, on this main screen, will they jump to people's main screen if they speak? I'm not sure. Let's so find out. Renee, you need to speak <laughs> up. I see Renee. This is Renee. I have this thing. Ah, there you oh, go. nifty. So that looks like some sort of xylaria from what I can tell. Uh, what's that growing on? It's kind of like, I think it's a big wood chip. Oh, okay. Uh, oh geez, I can't, I'm blanking on the species name on that. If anybody else can jump in and help me out. Um, so it's, um, it's really powdery. Like the white is like talcum powder. So and those then, are the, those are the and then when I had it in a box, it left like this, this haze of like black spores all over there everything. There you go. Um, so Xylaria tend to have black spores. Um, they are decomposers. Now, you don't think there's anything inside that lump of carpet. You want me to, what do you want me to do? <laughs> Just, uh, is, are they fairly tough tendrils there? Uh, yeah, they're tough and they leave this white powder, like. 
if you touch it, you get like this white powder all over you. Sure. So it's a Zylaria. I can't, I'm blanking. At least I think it is. I'm blanking it's, on the. It's very uh, tough. Yeah, it doesn't break. Um, McCoy is saying Zylaria <laughs> hy hypoxylon in the comments. Uh, okay. Well, there you, you go. Yeah. Um, so these are similar to something like Dead Man's Fingers. They're decomposing the, uh, the wood there and they send out these tendrils. Um, I'm not sure about the white powdery portion because they do have black spores as far as I know. Yeah, um, the, box, the box that I put them in is like full of black powder now. <laughs> so they're, they're an ascomycete. So they have, um, they have a little parathesium, which is kind of like a little vase that's, that's bur buried in the flesh of the mushroom. And uh, the ASCII will puff up with fluid and poke through a little hole and eject the spores. And so that's why like you can even have stuff above it and it'll get darkened from the spores shooting out of those ASCII. Um, and then those shrivel up and a new one will, will replace it and poke through the little hole. Um, I am not too certain about what the white powdery coating would be on that. Um, if anybody else wants to chime in on that. I also have a uh, pheasant back. Oh, there you go. So that's, um, oh, oh, there you go. I'm, uh, I guess I have to talk if people want to see what I'm holding. So these are commonly found when we're all hunting for morels. Uh, this is the dryad saddle. I believe they may have switched it from polyporous. Anamorph, okay. I was wondering if that might be what that was. Um, Syriaporous. It used to be um, polyporous. Oh, that's nice. Um, polyporous squamosis. If you were to cut that, if we were at the meeting and give that a whiff, it uh, actually, See if you can say what you think it smells like. Um, I think it smells like a cucumber. That's a very common, I find it's a little more like watermelon rind, but cucumbers right in there too. Um, it is an edible. I don't think many would say choice. <laughs> I've actually tasted it, it wasn't too bad. You have to get them really fresh and young. Yeah, they're fresh, they're pretty good, I think. Yeah. And, and you'd want to cut like the edge off where the knife just slides right through like butter. Cool. Wait, that works well. The others? Is that the Tom stuff? I'm sorry? Is, is that everything you had, Renee? Um, I have this thing, oh, but I don't have to go through it if we don't want to. Uh, the elegant poly, another polypore. Um, it used, it's polyporous elegans. They, I think they've changed that as well. <laughs> Um, I'm saying seriaporous squamosis now. Oh, that's for the last one. Yeah. Um, so, as you notice, both of these bases are very black. Um, and I was told in the past that if, you know, the true polypore, you see how it's darkening there at the base, eventually that, that darkness would run all the way up the stipe towards the cap. Um, these are different though. Um, and uh, I was told when I first started that true polypores had black stems like that. I don't think that's necessarily the case now. And as you've seen from the name changes, it's not even in polyporous anymore. And I believe that they've changed this. I don't know if it's out of polyporous or not, but I believe they changed its name too. <laughs> Another wood decomposer. That was not edible. <laughs> not toxic, but yeah. You yeah, I mean, want. you wouldn't want to eat it from here. That's my, my, my point. Thank you. Sure. So now we have Tom, I think. But yeah. what, do you have a mushroom, Tom? Or was it? Yeah. yeah. So we've seen oyster mushrooms many times at the club meetings, but we've never seen this particular oyster mushroom, at least 
not in my tenure of however many years it's been now. So um, when we say oyster mushroom, that, that's really inclusive of three different species. There's a winter oyster mushroom, which is Pleurotus ostriatus. There's a summer oyster, mo oyster mushroom, which is Pleurotus ostriatus. <laughs> there's a third one, uh, doesn't really grow around Washington, D.C. because it grows almost exclusively on poplar trees. Uh, this one is called Pleurotus populinus, and its, and its tree of choice are quaking aspen. And this is nothing. This is 10 minutes of collection. If I wanted to, they are really popping right now. If I would have wanted to this weekend, I could have easily filled up 10 garbage bags of, of uh, oyster mushrooms. Um, I don't think you said where you are. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm riding out the uh, quarantine at my parents' place in central Pennsylvania. It's uh, very rural here. And uh, so there is a lot of, a lot of uh, good woodlands to go find mushrooms in. Tom, what, what are the distinguishing characteristics of that species? Uh, like all oyster mushrooms, I think for me, uh, obviously the, uh, just the search image of it is, is very good. These will grow in, um, in layers on, on top of, well, for this particular species, on uh, dead and dying quaking aspen. Quaking aspen is a type of tree that reproduces uh, colonial, colonially. So where you see one, you'll see a hundred. And that's why it's so easy to collect these. Uh, I always think that the best diagnostic for oyster mushrooms is the aroma. And it's hard to pin down what they smell like, but they do smell, they do have a, a, an aroma, a pleasant aroma that is all their own. And uh, I think one other thing too that I always find so intriguing about oyster mushrooms is these mushrooms are nematophagous. And that's a fancy way of saying that they're carnivores. So oyster mushrooms and their hyphal threads that they weave through the, uh, the uh, wood, um, those hyphal threads are spiked with a uh, chemicals to para uh, paralyze nematodes, which are microscopic flatworms swimming through Not the roundworms. Or <laughs> roundworms. <laughs> and whenever they, whenever they, uh, whenever they disable these these roundworms, then the uh, then the uh, fungus will consume it. They do this for two reasons. One, because nematodes will are uh, a lot of nematodes attempt to eat mushrooms, so they're deterring uh, that, that type of action. The other thing is it's a supplement because nematodes have nitrogen, and nitrogen is often a limiting factor in uh, growth for, well, for everything, really. That's why uh, when you look at your bag of fertilizer, it says NPK, nitrogen is listed first. And if you were inquiring, I don't know who asked the question, whether you can visually tell these from the ones we find in our area, that's kind of tough. It's more like what is the substrate that it's growing from? And this is why he's able to call that because it's growing on these quaking aspen. And I think somebody just mentioned uh, the instructions for taking photographs. I was planning on I'll write something up and I'll send it to Tom. So when he sends out his update, he can include that so that you guys will know like how you should take the pictures and I'll see how many takers we get and I, I can just kind of work out which ones to use and all to try and fill 15 minutes. But you can plan on it for next month. So uh, right. I think it's been a good trial, uh, and I think now you'll have the whole month. If you're going to take a picture, you don't have to actually have the mushroom there. Mm -hmm. so that gives you some, you know, if you find something in the woods uh, that's worth talking about, that should open. And then you could select the ones that are, you know, would be better to talk about. So I think that's a good plan to go forward. Um, 
we we've still got a little more time if there are any more mushrooms. I can I have uh, some macro photography of some lichens. Yeah, <laughs> you could share those there, if you I'm not they were <laughs> beautiful apprehensive maybe. because I don't want to blow up the meeting. <laughs> okay. Um I, do you I want to see if I know what it is? Or is this just for mystery mushrooms? Oh, you can, if you know what it is, that's fine too. Yeah, it's any, yeah, it's anything you want uh, to discuss or have, uh, have interest in. I, you know, we want to keep it to probably five to 10 at most and keep it to roughly 15 minutes. So <laughs> that's the limits we've got. I think that you mentioned this one already, but you said people are finding it. Let's see. Huge piece there. I'll put it behind a, a black background. You need to hold it. Yeah, hold it up a little bit. Left in a. Can you see it really, or we need more light? It looks kind of bright. It's like it. I don't know if we needed more light or less. Closer would be better. No. Oh yeah, let's you can see. Can, so this can you hold it right up to your camera? Yeah. And turn it in different directions so you can see yeah, the stem. And, and, and actually this would be a good one to possibly look at the gills if we can. And if we could if we could see that, this is where photographs work good. This it looks like a white, we should flush white. Um, but that's okay. So this is probably the Neolentinus lepidus. Um, one of its distinctive features is it kind of has serrated gill margins. Um, so instead of being smooth, it's more like a serrated knife. Uh, those grow on conifer. And yeah. they tend to have those scaly top um, we had a picture, somebody else, we were talking in an email um, that may have some that aren't necessarily, the, the scales aren't as brown. Um, and as uh, William was talking about the, them res the mushrooms responding to light, I'm not, I'm speculating here, but some mushrooms actually will produce keratin and that might help to darken the scales if these mushrooms were out in the sun. That's speculation. I don't know if that is actually the case for these, but I had a, a picture that somebody sent me and it was almost pure white, but it certainly looked like that mushroom and it was covered with bushes. So it, it was not exposed to much light. And so that may have been part of what had happened there. Uh, one uh, mushroom that definitely does that is Hen of the Woods. You can find what we, I, I've actually found a hen of the woods that had a piece of bark that had fallen over half and the other half was out exposed to the light. And when you picked up that piece of bark there, you know, that side was super pale and just looked like a totally different mushroom than the side that was actually exposed to the light. So that may be what's happening getting some of those darker and lighter scales on the top. Any other mushrooms? Any others? <laughs> Mitch, I um, saw some, um, uh, we saw a lot of Stropharia rugoso annulata, commonly mm -hmm. known as wine caps around here, none of which I tried because I think I'm allergic to them, but oh, other no. people tried them and said they were great. And I will try to put up on the screen here if I uh, am, am able to share a screen. Um, let's see if I can do this. Uh, let's see, how do I share that? Oh, look at that. Share, how do I share? Share, there we go. Now, can you see a mushroom now? Not unless you're one. Nope, <laughs> okay. And I see some files somebody shared, but I have to, I guess I could download it. In the chat, yeah. I shared a couple of uh, ones in our backyard. They're uh, on the, in the chat. They, they didn't open, yeah. it's just a JPEG. I guess I could save it and see, but um, I'll see what I can do. Keep seeing if you can get yours going there. Uh, yeah, um, let's see. 
how can I do this? Um, These could be ones that we can save for next time too, you guys. Yeah, I think probably this is the why we want to plan the event around a picture type operation rather than trying to wing it here. Uh, so unless there's some uh, breakthrough momentarily, I suggest that we should move on to our program. That works. Uh, who had planned to, we, we are at our 15 minute uh, time limit that I think is reasonable. We can revise that if we want to, but for the moment, I think we should go on. So, um, oh, oh, nice. So did I get a mushroom you. here? You did. Okay, so this mushroom right here is a Ruguso annulata, and you can see the very distinct um, uh, ring on it. And there's another close up, maybe when we're sharing stuff this weekend uh, or on Friday, you can see the striations on this ring. What's and interesting can... about this mushroom here is this mushroom is a Ovoida cystadia, uh, Psilocybe ovoida cystadia, which just happened to be growing next to it in a similar sort of place. Um, and um, I, it's just something that looks like a little brown mushroom. And I have a series of pictures of like a handful of little brown mushrooms that might be mistaken for this. This is what the ovos, you can see kind of the blue tint along the edge here. And underneath here. That's probably where you were handling it, I'm guessing. No, it looked like that when I picked it up. And yeah, and it'll, it'll, very it'll, it'll distinct be. white um, uh, mycelium at the base. And uh, where these grow apparently is uh, like floodplains next to streams and rivers where there's buried wood and they were yeah, coming and up, and which is and why it yeah. will go so annulata as well. And then here's an example of uh, two different mushrooms uh, showing the size of the small caps and large caps, and they change color from white to light brown as they get older. It should go to a dark blackish purple yes, and black. Here, here's uh, oh, here it's gotten darker, black darker on these. So psilocybe used to be in Stropharia, and if you remember that first picture, um, you can really see the this, this spore color on there. It's got that kind of purple-black coloration. Right. Um, and psilocybe have a, a similar spore color. So anyways, it was kind of unusual to find it. Only second time in my life I've ever seen this mushroom. Um, but it That's is around cool. in the Washington area. I cannot report on exactly what the <laughs> properties are. Okay. Okay. Cool. Well, we should probably move on to the program. Uh, is there any other discussion before? Uh, Elizabeth, is our program uh, speaker signed on? And I, I, I would call on Tom to do the introduction. I, I can, but. So we're looking for Dr. Christopher Smith. Yep, Christopher Tom, did you want to do a little introduction? I uh, I actually put <laughs> the burden on that on to uh, on Chris himself. He's going to oh. give us right. a little background. We'll segue with. to him, and mm -hmm. all I know is the name and the subject, and but he can do that better than I. So Chris, you want to take over the screen and uh, present yourself and your discussion on marine mycology? Sure. One second to get my screen shared. Um, can everybody see my PowerPoint okay? Yes. Yep, yep we see it. Great. Um, great, so, so thank you for having me. Um, my name is, is Chris Smith. I'm a professor at Lock Haven University. Um, at least I'm, I'm finishing up my time at Lock Haven University right now. Uh, I'm moving on to uh, Binghamton University as a lecturer this fall uh, up in upstate New York. But um, a little bit about me. I got my BS in biology uh, at Lock Haven, actually, uh, back in 2013. For those of you that don't know, Lock Haven is a, uh, is a small state school in the middle of Pennsylvania. It's very close to State College, Penn State University. Um, got my BS there in biology. That's where I learned about mycology. Um, I was pretty 
uh, dead set on becoming uh, a marine biologist, actually. Uh, funny enough, I decided to, to pursue that in central Pennsylvania. Um, nobody told me there were no oceans here. So I guess, you know, you live and you learn. Uh, kidding. I'm not sure how jokes fall uh, on Zoom meetings. I'm not so so when I give a seminar, if I give a joke, usually you hear people laugh, you can see their face and here I only see a few of you at first. So uh, forgive me if any of my jokes fall flat. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, after I got my uh, BS at, at Lock Haven, I went on to Penn State, uh, where I got my PhD. Uh, in plant pathology uh, and just recently finished that in 2018. Uh, since then, I've been back at Lock Haven. Um, it's a, been a real uh, interesting experience uh, being able to teach at my, my alma mater from undergrad. So I've been teaching alongside my, my, um, the people who introduced me to biology and even the people who introduced me to mycology uh, to begin with. And just kind of a, a fun fact uh, to go along with that is uh, the, the fungi issue that was held up earlier um, with the, the contagion, the current issue contagion on, on the front page there is actually, um, that's actually a sexual structure for a fungus, Pseudogenoascus. It's a new species of Pseudogenoascus that was described by one of my undergraduate students uh, at Lock Haven University. That's actually a picture that she took uh, with a confocal scanning microscope. Um, so that was kind of a cool, to, it's cool to see that out there on, on a fungi magazine. Um, so let's see. Uh, I, I, like I said, I got my start in mycology in undergrad. Um, I went to the PEC 4A for the first time in 2011 in upstate New York, and that kind of introduced me to the wonderful world of mushrooms and got me really interested. And so um, since then, I've been trying to combine these interests in, um, uh, of my marine biology, my original interest in mycology, and I've kind of found myself in this weird spot that not many other people seem to be occupying when it comes to uh, fungal biology. So I'm excited to share with you guys today some of the things that I, I do in marine mycology. And um, first and foremost, I'm, I'm actually a teacher. I mean, uh, at Lock Haven, we're a primarily undergraduate institution. And um, so I teach a full teaching load. Um, I do have a few research students that do some undergraduate research, but I'm not, I don't work with graduate students, or PhD students of any sort or anything like that. So primarily I teach, uh, and that will be my job at Binghamton as well. Um, but while I've been at Lock Haven, uh, I had the opportunity to develop a, a field course in coastal and marine mycology, uh, which we'll move on to the next slide here. Um, and so, so I was able to teach this course last summer, and I, I'm going to start by talking to you guys a little bit about this because uh, um, it was a really awesome opportunity to explore an ecosystem that people don't tend to associate with fungi. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons is that you don't see fruiting mushrooms underwater, uh, you know, generally, unless you've uh, taken one growing on a stick and thrown it in a stream nearby. Um, you, don't, you don't see the fruiting mushrooms really underwater. Um, but there are lots of cool fungi, more on the microscopic side, uh, that exist in these ecosystems. And so um, a, a quick kind of tangential point to that. Uh, this course I taught was at the Chincoteague Bay Field Station, um, which is actually not too, too far from the D.C. area. Um, and if any, if any of you have ever been to the eastern shore uh, and, and been down Chincoteague or Assateague Islands, the Chincoteague Bay Field Station is nearby there on Wallops Island. It's actually right next to the uh, NASA Wallops uh, facility. And uh, they have more than just undergraduate courses. I taught an undergraduate college course. Um, but they have adult and family uh, environmental education programs for, for all ages, uh, from kids all the way up through adults, um, fantastic summer programs um, to check out if that's something that anyone is interested in. Unfortunately, this year they are closed because of COVID, um, so they're taking a pretty hard hit financially uh, because of the current pandemic. And unfortunately, also, uh, I was scheduled to teach this course again uh, this summer, which has since been canceled because of COVID as well. Um, so unfortunately, we won't be able to uh, take any undergrads there this year, but I'm hoping to be able to continue this in the future. Um, so a little bit about some of the ecosystems we got to explore um, and some of the fungi we find there. So the um, first thing you probably think of, if you think coastal or marine, you, you think of the ocean or you think of the beach. Um, and when you think of the beach, you probably don't think about fungi being prominent on the beach, but um, that is, is, it's actually quite op the opposite. Fungi are, are pretty abundant 
um, in, in beach sand environments on, on many different substrates. Um, you just got to look a little closer sometimes um, than you might think. Uh, and sometimes the stuff you look at kind of smells. Uh, but as mycologists, we're sometimes used to that as well. Uh, so below the picture of the beach here, I have a salt marsh, common coastal uh, ecosystem uh, uh, around our uh, kind of eastern shore area up and down uh, the temperate regions of North America. Uh, predominantly, uh, you see Spartina cordgrass uh, in these ecosystems. And some of the fungi I'm going to talk to you about here in a second um, are found growing on and in this vegetation. And so fungi actually play a really important part uh, and a really important role in decomposition and recycling uh, the nutrients of some of these dead, uh, some dead cordgrass and other detritus back into the salt marsh ecosystem. And there are some really unique and cool looking fungi um, that you can find just by scouring uh, through these salt marshes and whatnot. Um, and then uh, the third image below is, is um, not as high up as I would have hoped it, it would have showed up, but this is from the, the back end of a boat. And one of the cool things we got to do um, with the students was actually take them out um, off the coast. And we actually have plankton nets um, that we put into the water and tow behind the boat um, to look for what we call mycoplankton, because there are actually fungi that live in the water column. Um, they play roles in decomposition. Some are just, you know, you do have like just floating spores that get in there from the air, but there are fungi that play a role in, in decomposition. They play an important ecological role there. Um, the interactions with phytoplankton communities and other types of microorganisms in these oceanic environments. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then you get more ancient lineages of, of, of fungi in, in water uh, aquatic environments, marine environments like chytrids as well that you can find. Um, and so we got to explore all of these environments uh, uh, in, in search of fungi. And so um, to give you some examples of where you might look uh, for, for these fungi, and this is one of my favorite ones, is if you've ever walked along the beach uh, on the East Coast here, whether you're in Rehoboth, Delaware Beach, Dewey Beach, uh, all the way down to Ocean City, Maryland, and beyond to Chincoteague and Assateague, um, you've probably seen something like this, uh, where you have uh, just like, vegetation, dead vegetation washed up. Sometimes it smells a little bit. If you take it back to your house, it definitely will start to smell after a little while. Um, but you might not believe it, but there's actually an incredible diversity of fungi that can be found just below the surface of this dead vegetation. Um, and one example here, and this is actually a dissecting scope image, and you can probably get just as good uh, an image with a hand lens um, of this, all these little circles, these little black craters here, it almost look like volcanic eruptions coming out. Of uh, This is, this is uh, one of these pieces of vegetation up close. And these, uh, just underneath the surface of this plant is a bulbous little fruiting body called a parathesia, because all of these are, are ascomycete fungi generally. Um, and so they have the sexual structure of parathesia, which looks like a little flask. So if you would take a, a razor and you just pop underneath the, the vegetation there, you can actually pop out the little fruiting bodies. Um, and they're big enough that you can hold them between your fingers. Um, and, and you wouldn't believe it just looking at this image, but underneath that uh, vegetation is, is all these little fruiting bodies all over the place. That's pretty cool to look at, but if you take an even up, more up close and personal look using a compound microscope, the ascospores or the sexual spores that these fungi produce come in amazing shapes and sizes as well. Um, this is an example of one of the most common ones we found in salt marshes, but also one of, I think, one of the coolest ones. Um, these are ascospores coming out of an ascus, and so the ascus is the sac that holds the ascospores. Um, and and so these are all ascospores of the fungus uh, Halobisothecium obionis. And um, it's commonly found uh, on the salt marsh cord grass just below the surface of the vegetation. Um, and it's got this kind of really kind of beautiful four-celled pattern. Um, and, and what all these larger kind of droplets in here that you see, um, it's hypothesized that these are actually some sort of oil droplet that may play a role in helping these spores float in an aquatic environment. Um, so, uh, and, and here, this, this bottom picture, these are, they're even bigger in here, more well-developed in here. You can see these larger kind of oil droplets in there. So, um, so a really cool fungus. And then just going back a couple of slides, another one that we found um, that was really fun to look at uh, was this, and actually the genus name is escaping my head at the moment. So um, if I remember, I will come back to it. But this is another one we found on this, on this vegetation. Um, and uh, what was really cool about this is coming out of that ascus sac, 
it actually has a gelatinous sheath around each spore. And you can really see it around this one. Um, you know, I, I didn't stain these. These are, just, these are just straight on a compound microscope, no stain, just sitting in water. Um, so, they, so the spores themselves have this yellowish tinge to them. And then around them, there's this gelatinous kind of uh, uh, sac, if you will. Um, and so there are some probably really cool ecological purposes uh, to the way these spores are shaped uh, and, and the structures that they have associated with them. And one of the really fascinating things about coastal and marine fungi is that we know almost nothing about them. Um, where there's, there's been, there's a lot of historical research on, uh, on marine fungi, but it's, but it's limited. It was done by a small handful of people over several decades. And, you know, since it's not really, it's, it started to come more to the forefront in, in research circles for mycology now, um, but, but until recently that wasn't the case. And so um, there's a lot left to be discovered in these coastal and oceanic environments, um, whether we're walking on the beach, in a marsh, or even out at sea. Uh, there, there are fungi that play an important role in, in the ecology of these ecosystems that we tend to just ignore um, for uh, other, in, in place of other things. So there's lots of research that's been done on, for example, bacterial communities um, in these environments, and, and fungi tend to get overlooked. And um, as, a, as a mycologist, one of the things that drives me absolutely insane is um, if you've heard the buzzword microbiome, um, we talk about the microbiome, the human microbiome, all the microorganisms associated with whether it be our body or an environment or something like that. Um, it's, it's very typical for, for people just to be referring to bacteria as part of the microbiome. But, but in reality, fungi are a huge part of the microbiome too. There are fungi all over and in our body that play roles that we have yet to discover for a lot of them um, uh, in our health. And then um, just thinking about these oceanic or, or salt marsh coastal environments, what roles the fungi play there? Um, you know, they've been widely ignored for a really long time. So um, it's, it was really an awesome experience to get students down there. A lot of them, these are students, the students you see pictured here, they had never taken a mycology class before. Most of them hadn't even thought about fungi um, as, as in, in any way, shape or form other than mushrooms on their pizza, uh, you know, before they came down and took this class. So, um, you know, there, it was a really great opportunity to get out and, and, and show them how cool uh, fungi can be and how, how diverse uh, marine fungi in particular uh, can be. And so uh, that's where I wanted to start just kind of talking a little bit about um, my teaching in, in marine mycology and something that I'm hoping to do in the future is continue teaching a course like this. Um, uh, I, would, I would like to eventually open up a course like this to, to not just undergraduate students, to make it just for anyone who wants to learn about marine fungi. Um, field stations like the Chincoteague Bay Field Station um, serve as excellent resources to do those kinds of things. Um, you know, so if I ever do end up teaching a course uh, uh, like that, I I'll, will certainly send uh, that information along to your society here uh, uh, as well. Um, so before I before I jump into a little bit about the research that I do in marine fungi and have done in marine fungi, does anybody have any questions specifically about teaching or coastal marine mycology that I can answer right now? We did actually get one in the chat, which is how do you actually know when you're looking at those cells under the microscope that you're looking at a fungus? That's a great question. And so, um, and it takes some practice too, and that's actually a common question I would get from my students because there's a lot of stuff you can get under the microscope, especially when you sample a marine environment or soil or anything like that. And so how do you tell that it's a fungus? Um, with, specifically with what we were looking at here with these, with these ascomycetes that are forming these fruiting bodies, we're looking for certain patterns, like the, the sac, uh, the asca sac that has the spores in it, usually eight ascospores in it. Um, there's kind of a pattern to that that you start to recognize over time where you can go, okay, this is clearly a fungal fruiting body uh, producing spores. You can also look for fungal growth. So, so when you're looking at, at spores, you're looking at, at something that hasn't yet started to grow necessarily. Um, when you're looking at fungal growth, you might be looking uh, at, at hyphae, individual strands of fungal growth. And you can actually look for uh, the cross walls in, in the fungus um, to, to see, if, you know, well, uh, compared to other things you might see, like a blade, like a hair or a blade of grass or something like that under the microscope, um, you know, you start to recognize those patterns as you go. If that, I hope that answered your question okay. I 
Any other questions? I think we're good to go. Oh, wait, no, one more. Mitch is asking, you mentioned oil droplets and the spores. These are mentioned when referring to terrestrial mushrooms as well. Do you know the purpose of them? Um, from a terrestrial perspective, no, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, I don't know. Uh, but I've, in some of the marine literature, there's been some hypotheses thrown around. And these are just hypotheses, just educated guesses um, for, in, a, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, a lot of research has not been done on, on the physiology of marine fungi. Um, but but it's, it's thought that some of these uh, droplets and other things could play a role uh, in, in how the spore kind of gets through the water column uh, from like a flotation standpoint or something like that. But terrestrially, I'm not 100% sure. All right, thank you for the questions. Um, the next thing I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about here um, is the, some of the research I've conducted on marine fungi. Um, and, and I'm not gonna bore you with all the details of it, um, but there are some cool little stories um, that I wanna get at in here. So, so I'll, I'll try to get to the end of the first one here. And if we have time, I'll jump into the second story um, from there. So um, overall, uh, like I had mentioned at the beginning, I, I spent a lot of time trying to marry my interests of marine biology and mycology. Um, and I got my degree in plant pathology. And so um, there, there wasn't much room for that when I was studying agricultural fungi and things like that. Um, but fortunately, I was working uh, in what's called the Fusarium Research Center. Um, which is a culture collection at Penn State that houses over 20,000 strains of fus fusarium species. So what is fusarium? Um, and this is a common uh, spore that you might see uh, if you look at fusarium under a microscope. Um, fusarium is a, a cosmopolitan fungus, uh, meaning it's, it's found pretty much everywhere. Um, if you were taking a little bit of soil from outside of your house or apartment and put it on a petri dish uh, to select for, for, for fungi, chances are you'd probably get some fusarium growing out. Um, they make these canoe-shaped or banana-shaped spores, and this is a, a microscope image of those. They're incredibly important economically and agriculturally. They, ag agriculturally, they, they uh, cause a lot of disease, a lot of plant diseases. Um, they're known mycotoxin producers as well, um, and they're also known opportunistic human pathogens. So they can infect humans too. Certain species can infect humans, and, and as well as animals, um, so causing veterinary infections. So the story I kind of want to talk about here today is um, this species of fusarium that we're working on describing that's actually associated with marine animals strictly. Um, it falls into what we call the morpha species, fusarium solani, which is an ecologically diverse group um, of plant pathogens, um, plant endophytes, meaning they live in, in uh, symbiosis with plants and mutualisms with plants. Um, soil inhabitants, so they just live in the soil. Um, they can also, these opportunistic pathogens of humans, so they can cause infections in humans. Um, in particular, some of them like human eyeballs. We'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, but also veterinary infections. So they can cause uh, infections in lots of different types of animals. And the one I'm gonna talk about uh, causes infections in marine animals. But before I jump into that, um, some of the characteristics we use to define um, this morpha species. So when I say morpha species, I'm talking about using the characteristics that we can see to identify the species. It may not be the actual, what we would call phylogenetic species, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. Um, but when you're looking at physical characteristics of the fungi, same thing with mushrooms, right? When you look at um, gill attachment and you look at the shape of the mushroom, things like that, those are morphological characteristics. For these molds, these ascomycetes, we do the same thing, um, but we look up close and personal at their um, asexual spores, in the case of uh, Fusarium solani, where you have these boat-shaped uh, spores called macroconidia, and then you can have these smaller spores called microconidia as well. Um, in culture, growing in a petri dish, they come in all shapes and, and, and color variations. They have these like pretty orange, pink uh, colorations to them sometimes, but some of them are white, um, and, and some of them can be a yellowish color. Um, but, but just to kind of give you an idea of the diversity of different characteristics you can see, uh, this is all considered the Fusarium solani morpho species. Okay, and so my next slide, it, it's, gonna, it's gonna look a little overwhelming, but there is a take home point here that I, that I wanna get across. 
Um, this is a phylogenetic tree of uh, what we call the Fusarium solani species complex. So um, at the kind of advent of using molecular data, looking at DNA um, to figure out, uh, to, to look closer at, at fungal relationships, we found that, you know, this morpho species, Fusarium solani, is actually 60 different species within this morpho species, 60 different species. And this is just a snapshot. There's three clades uh, or three major groups. Um, and this is just one of those groups, uh, clade three here. Um, but, but try not to get too bogged down by this figure. It's just, a, the point is there's a lot of species within uh, Fusarium solani. But the trick is you can't tell them apart. Under a microscope, you can't actually you can't actually make a decision as to which of these species you're looking at. Um, you need DNA to do that. Um, and so for some, for some of us, it might, that might kind of raise some questions like, what's the point in defining a species if you can't observe the differences and, and tell them apart? Um, but what's interesting is beyond the physical characteristics, there are actually ecological patterns too associated with species. And um, for example, one ecological pattern that stands out within these 60 species is that all known clinical, so medical associated and veterinary associated um, fusarium species, so those that infect humans and animals, are all in this one group we call clade three. So this is the one I'm showing you here on the screen. They all fall into this one group out of three. They're not in the other two groups at all. Within that group, four of them, so I'm gonna call the Fusarium solani species complex, FSSC, so I don't trip over myself talking about it uh, multiple times, but you're gonna see FSSC a lot. That's just Fusarium solani species complex. Four of these species are the most common Fusarium across the board associated with veterinary infections. That's Fusarium keratoplasticum, falciforme, petrolophyllum, and then our undescribed species, FSSC12. Now. We have these little numerical identifiers here, FSSE2, FSSE3 plus 4. And, and the reason we have this is because the whole process, in, in a sense, is kind of working backwards when it comes to identifying and, and classifying these species. Um, molecular data was brought into the picture, and this a tree, like what you see right here, was generated, and we're like, okay, we have 60 different species according to DNA, but we had no descriptions, no formal descriptions of a lot of these species. So until someone went in and actually did the morphological description, actually went in and described the characteristics that they saw um, and uh, formally and published that, they just got little uh, little uh, numerical placeholders, FSSE2, which is now keratoplasticum three and four, which is falciforme. So right now, FSSE 12 is just a placeholder as we formally describe uh, this new species. And so another characteristic, and I'll come back to this, is that these three species, notice all four of these are common veterinary uh, pathogens. These three in particular with names are also common human pathogens, but FSSE 12 is not, and we'll come back to that. So Let's talk a little bit about FSSC12. So all of the isolates, all of the fungal isolates we have of FSSC12 are dominated by those from associated with marine animal infections. They've, they've been found infecting uh, prawn and, and shrimp causing kind of a black gill disease type uh, syndrome. Um, they've been found infecting uh, bonnet head and hammerhead sharks. They've been found infecting seahorses. In fact, they caused, caused a mass die off of seahorses in an aquarium um, a couple of years ago. Um, and they've been found infecting horseshoe crabs. In fact, if you look at this table here, um, what I'm highlighting here is just all the different hosts we have found these species on, okay? And in fact, they come from all over the world as well. Now, what I wanna highlight here as well is if you look at the associated literature here, look at these dates, 1989, 1995, 1978. So we've had these isolates for decades. Um, but for a long time, they were just classified as Fusarium solani. And in fact, we have letters dating back into the 70s and 80s from um, the researchers that ran the Fusarium Research Center that I was working in, where they just uh, letters back and forth between them and a certain aquaria and other um, aquaculture settings where they were asking them to identify these fungi. And they were like, yes, they're Fusarium solani. They just have a weird they have some weird characteristics, but they are Fusarium salon. And then they got put into the culture collection and forgotten about until um, I came along and they needed to, me to do something to earn my keep. So, um, so 
what I went back and did was pulled all of these isolates out of our culture collection to see, okay, are these, so I had to sequence a bunch of their DNA. Um, and then I went and I wanted to look at the morphological characteristics because I wanted to know, are there morphological characteristics that we can use to differentiate this species from others? Because that really hasn't been the case for these uh, species within Fusarium solani. So um, again, just to kind of highlight that, uh, I'm gonna be, I was looking at morphological characteristics like spore size and shape, um, culture characteristics, so what they looked like in a Petri dish, um, and growth rate, how fast they grew. And, and then for molecular, there are multiple kind of genes, housekeeping genes that we use, and I'm not gonna go into the nitty gritty on the genes um, at this point, but essentially the genes tell us it's a new species. So we're trying to see if, if we can look at morphology and look at what they look like and see if we can find patterns by kind of working backwards, now knowing that, that, that this is its own species. Um, so I don't have to say FSSE 12 anymore. We are naming this species Fusarium aquariorum, um, aquariorum meaning of the aquaria. And so one of the reasons we chose this name is actually because it, this is associated with marine animals, but one of the other patterns that we noticed was that all of the marine animals were in either an aquarium or an aquaculture setting. So we're not talking about marine animals uh, in the open ocean. Now, that doesn't mean this isn't growing on animals in the open ocean, but sampling is often very biased based on um, where it's needed, right? So if you are running an aquaculture uh, facility for prawn or shrimp, you're gonna be concerned if there's a fungal outbreak. So you're gonna ask someone to identify the fungus. But if you're someone out catching fish uh, just for fun and you catch a fish with a fungus growing on it, you're not gonna try and, well, some of us might, but I might, but you're not necessarily gonna ask someone to try and identify it and culture it and figure out what it is. So there's, there's really no information on whether or not this fungus is found in the natural ocean environment, but we do have information on it from aquarium settings and from aquaculture settings. So we call it Aquariorum reflecting its exclusive association with built saltwater habitats. And so this is just the phylogenetic tree showing that yes, it is its own species based on the genetics. These are all the known isolates that we have. They all come out on this branch together. Um, and that tells us, yes, okay, the genes tell us we're good to go. All of these isolates are, are this one species, Fusarium aquariorum. Now, let's talk about morphology, because this is the really interesting part to me. Because we're working backwards here. Up until this point, everybody was just throwing these cultures into a big pile and saying, Fusarium solani, morphospecies species with some variable characteristics to them. Now, the top uh, row here that you see, these are four sister species to our Fusarium aquariorum. Fusarium solani, so there is, we, we did choose one Fusarium species within the solani complex that we call, this is the true Fusarium solani. So it got the name Fusarium solani, sensu stricto. But then we've got the other three, and if you remember, I talked about those um, as the other human pathogen, uh, the, uh, the other veterinary pathogens that can also be human pathogens, very closely related to Fusarium aquariorum. And you notice on, on potato dextrose auger, which is our common growth medium, they form this kind of white fluffy mass. A couple of them are a little pinkish if you look close. All eight of these are different isolates of our Fusarium aquariorum species grown in the same conditions on potato, de potato dextrose auger. And they produce this, what we're characterizing as a wine red pigment uh, on this medium. And you can also see they, they grew out for the same amount of time over the same number of days. And you can see they grew a lot less than their sister species up here. So that was the first thing that clued us in to say, maybe there are some more, maybe there is some morphology we can look at here and say, hey, you know, this will help us differentiate these species. I also like how they look. One of the nice things about working with Fusarium is they produce all these crazy pigments. So they, I've seen purples and pinks. Like I have some that produce like a deep purple color uh, and, and pinks and oranges and reds. So they're fun to work with in the lab too because of those colors. We also looked at spore size. So those long canoe shaped spores I told you about, on average, the sp those spores were longer for Aquarium. Um, although there were some isolates where their spores were about the same size as their sister species as well. So could be a characteristic, but there's probably some flexibility there that might make it hard to use as the only characteristic to tell them apart. What really, and, and this is a bit of a, a complicated figure, but, but um, the, the take home message here for this one is Fusarium aquariorum, uh, what was really interesting is it grew a lot slower uh, than its sister species at room temperature, which is 25 degrees Celsius, and in an incubator at 30 degrees Celsius, which you actually can see pretty visually right here. Oops, sorry. 
right here, you can see after the same amount of time, there's a lot less growth on Fusarium aquariorum compared to its sister species. So we were just putting numbers to that, putting data to that um, to show that it was real. And actually what we found later on was uh, we did some, we, because uh, the other three species have, are known human pathogens, we decided to up the temperature to 37 degrees Celsius, which is human body temperature. And if you wanna be a good human pathogen, you wanna be able to infect people, you gotta be able to survive at human body temperature. And Fusarium aquari aquariorum does not. It does not survive at body temperature, whereas its species, sister species grow really well uh, at human body temperature. So another potential characteristic we can use. And so, so the take home message for this project and the story behind this is we actually went from having a morphological species using these characteristics that we can see to describe something. And we jumped into the world of DNA and found, wow, there are 60 different species, which we call cryptic species within this morpho species, but we can't tell them apart. Um, but maybe sometimes what it takes is for us to go backwards and go through our old culture collections and look at other collections um, to look for actual morphological characters that could help us tell some of these species apart. Um, so so I, I think there's a place for this nice marriage of, of DNA and molecular work and morphology looking at, at, at characteristics to help us with fungal taxonomy and species identification and things like that um, as well. And so um, that was my first kind of adventure into, into marine fungi and marine fungal research. Um, and, and so um, my next, before I jump into my next story, I've kind of lost track of the time a little bit here. So what, how much time are we, thinking here as far as uh, when you want to wrap up the meeting. We should uh, end certainly by nine, but uh, you that's the kind of our general rule. But, okay. Uh, we've got plenty of time left. You have at least a half hour. Okay, great. I just wanted to make sure uh, I, was, I uh, wasn't sure where we were at here. Um, so, so my next uh, bit of uh, marine mycology that I got to do, and, and, and this kind of verges on both coastal and marine, um, was actually actually had to do with sea turtles. Um, so I have done some, I have some background working with um, what we call emerging fungal diseases of wildlife, um, which is becoming a pretty big problem um, across the world. And so uh, one of the projects I've worked on in the past uh, has to do with white nose syndrome in bats. Um, and if you haven't heard of it, it's a fungal disease that's been wiping out bat populations across North America since about 2006. And so um, I've done some research on that in the past. Um, um, other examples of wildlife diseases um, that you may have heard of include things like uh, chytrid, uh, which has caused a lot of uh, problems with amphibians, um, leading to the extinction of many species of, of, of frogs. And, and there's another species of, of chytrid that is problematic towards salamanders as well. So, so fungi are kind of uh, rearing their ugly head, so to speak, when it comes to uh, wildlife for a number of reasons, uh, varying from climate change to globalization and pet trade and things like that. Um, and so uh, I, I was fortunate to actually, while I was working on Fusarium, to stumble on um, a, a uh, discovery that someone made in 2010 of an outbreak uh, of, of Fusarium species in sea turtle nests. So I, I dug into that a little bit further. Um, and so the, the name of this disease, as we coined it, was, was is sea turtle egg fusariosis. Um, I'll, I'll call it STEF uh, throughout uh, the rest of this presentation. But it's caused by two species, Fusarium caratoplasticum and Fusarium falciforme, which um, if you remember from the last portion of my talk, these are two names that should look a little bit familiar. These are two of the most common veterinary pathogens that I was comparing as sister species to Aquariorum. Um, so, I want to give you a little bit of background on these two species, though, because it's actually really fascinating. They're, they're really well known as human pathogens. In fact, they're known to cause eye infections in people, okay? But their, their epidemiology is very, very different, okay? So you'll see uh, little boxes with FK and FF to represent FK is Fusarium caratoplasticum, FF is falciforme, all right? So Fusarium falciforme is, is a worldwide soil inhabitant. I, I would... I would uh, bet that you could go outside and, and probably isolate Fusarium falciforme outside of your house in the soil right now. It's everywhere, okay? Um, it can be particularly problematic in tropical agricultural settings um, because workers in these settings will sometimes get soil in their eye that can cause an abrasion, and if the fungus is present, um, it will cause an, inf an eye infection, and it's just warm enough down there to be a problem, okay, in tropical settings. Fusarium caratoplasticum, sorry, Keratoplasticum, FK, can also cause 
uh, eye infections like this, but they come from the built environment. In fact, they're mainly associated with an outbreak in 2005 to 2006 that was associated with a contact lens solution. And so the lab that I worked in, um, graduate student before me, was this was his project studying um, this outbreak and, and the fusarium species associated with this. And he did some really fun field work where he drove up and down the East Coast of the United States and swabbed bathroom sink drains, private and public, um, to grow out fusarium species and look at the diversity. Because the hypothesis was that the fusarium causing the eye infections associated with the contact lens solution had to exist in the bathroom somewhere. It was coming from the bathroom environment. And what they found was Fusarium caratoplasticum was wild, wildly abundant in bathroom sink drains. Now, does that mean you should go home and bleach your bathroom sink drain or stay home? I guess we're all at home potentially right now. But um, go bleach your bathroom sink drain? No. No, you're not going to get rid of it if it's there, most likely. Um, but uh, one of the problems with the contact lens solution was it, it just wasn't doing its job of, of killing uh, off the microorganisms that it needed to after its expiration date. So if they did, someone didn't replace the solution, uh, a fungal biofilm would grow on a contact lens and then people would put the contact lens directly in their eye. And I would argue that if you put any amount of fungal tissue in your eye, it will cause an infection somehow. Um, so, uh, so that's primarily how that happened. So um, Fusarium falciforme was also found in these sink drains, but to a much lesser extent. They found a few isolates of falciforme, but, but not, not like you see in soil environments. So keratoplasticum was the major one from built environments, okay? So that brings us to the sea turtles. So how does this all connect? In 2010, um, a group of researchers found Fusarium solani, and I put it in quotes because we're referring it to it as the morpho species, just using characteristics, and they used a single gene, but it wasn't enough to look deep enough to see which of those 60 species we're dealing with. They found Fusarium solani associated with high egg mortality in sea turtle nests in Cape Verde um, in 2010. And you can see in this image here, um, what they're pointing to is potential symptoms like a grayish mat on the egg, as well as pink splotches on the egg. Um, and as well as fungal growth on, on dead hatchlings. And then what you hear, see here in image C is what you would expect to see uh, of a healthy, non-hatched, but healthy sea turtle egg. It's a kind of more pure white look to it. Um, so not, no microbial growth on it, essentially. So they got about 25 isolates of this fungus from these eggs. Um, and uh, using ITS, they, uh, which is one of the genes we use, they, they decided it's in Fusarium solani somewhere, but we don't know where. We don't know which of the 60 species. So a few years later, they used what we call multi-locus sequence typing, and that's a fancy way of saying using more than one gene. So they used more than one gene uh, to determine that, hey, there's actually two species associated with this, with, with the fungi killing these eggs, um, Fusarium keratoplasticum and Fusarium falciforme. So, so here's where these connect back um, to our sea turtle eggs, okay? Furthermore, they found that these fungi were distributed in sea turtle nests all over the world. So they went around uh, and, and sampled sea turtle nesting sites all over the world. Um, every place you see listed here is where they sampled and they found Fusarium keratoplasticum and falciforme associated with dead eggs all over, okay? So what are we dealing with here? Are we dealing with a pathogen that's ripping through sea turtle nests? Are we dealing with something that's maybe just decomposing eggs and it, it looks like it could be a pathogen? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. We don't really know. I would argue that we still really don't know, but I'll, I'll kind of get to that as we go on here. Now, my research comes in because fortunately no one sampled in the United States. And so I was able to take advantage of some sampling sites in the United States um, to look and see what we were dealing with as far as these fungi are concerned. In fact, um, this is a, um, a map of sea turtle nesting density from 2012 to 2016. And um, you can see the red areas are high density, um, the, the orangish areas are medium density, and the yellow areas are low density, meaning just less nests overall over the course of a nesting season. Sea turtle nesting season in Florida runs between about May um, and October. And so um, there is actually a, a, a nesting program I'll talk about in a second associated with counting all these nests. Um, a little bit of background on sea turtles in the United States. 90% of all sea turtle nesting uh, that occurs in the U.S. occurs in Florida. Um, and of those, uh, of that 90%, there are three different sea turtle species that actually nest. There's loggerheads, um, which, there we go. There's loggerhead sea turtles, 
um, which lay the most nests. Uh, the next is the, uh, are the green turtles, and then the least number of nests are the leatherback turtles. Um, like I said, loggerheads are the most common. Um, in fact, the nesting population of loggerheads in Florida is among the largest nesting populations in the whole world. Um, then green turtles lay about 100 to 1,000 nests uh, each year, um, and leatherbacks lay about 30 to 60 nests across the whole of Florida each year. So where does all this nice data come from? The nesting surveys, uh, a bunch of nesting surveys are conducted throughout each season um, through what's called the Statewide Nesting Beach Survey, SNBS, through the F Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So they survey 215 beaches, over 825 miles of beach um, throughout the entire season. And this is primarily run by a handful of researchers and loads of volunteers people who go out and volunteer their time in the mornings and at night to monitor these nesting sites. Um, they take their sea turtles very seriously uh, in Florida. In fact, um, the funding for this program comes primarily from uh, the sea turtle license plate program. So if any of you have seen Florida drivers around, um, you may have seen uh, their license plate with little sea turtle hatchlings coming out uh, on the license plate. And that's actually a, a program used to fund the monitoring that goes on. Uh, down there. So, um, so that's you know a little bit of background on, on what's done in Florida as far as sea turtle nest monitoring is concerned. And so with all of this monitoring going on, you would think if there was disease in Florida for sea turtle eggs that somebody would see it, somebody would catch it, right? That would make sense. But this is a, this is a, uh, a figure from a paper looking at the um, mortality factor. So what causes the death of sea turtle eggs across Florida over the span of a decade from 2002 to 2012. And so the, on, the, on the bottom axis here, the x-axis, it's just split up, it splits Florida into different regions, Northeast Florida, Central East, Southeast, so on, so forth. When you look at the actual graph here on the, the bars, there are, the different colors are associated with different mortality factors. So what caused the death? So um, just looking at Northeast here, the green is complete washouts, which is when um, you have the tide comes up and just completely wipes out a nest, often occurs in association with storm systems like hurricanes and tropical storms, storm surge. Um, predation by ghost crabs, which can be a big problem. Um, ghost crabs like to eat the sea turtle eggs too, so they'll get into the nest and they'll eat the eggs, uh, is purple. Um, the light blue is mammalian depredation, so um, things like raccoons, coyotes, feral cats, foxes, you name it, love to eat sea turtle eggs, so they'll get into these nests too. Um, and then the orange is other, so things like ants, the fire ants are bad, um, they'll get in there and they'll, they'll, they'll eat through an entire nest. Um, roots of plants can get in there as well and kill off the, the eggs, um, as well as poaching uh, of eggs as well. Um, what, what I didn't talk about is what might stand out to you most in this, in this figure are the big blue bars. And the big blue bars are where there was mortality, but they didn't report any mortality factors. So they don't know what caused the mortality. So for most of the nests that, that had no mortality factors associated with them, even though there was death, um, they had about a 75% success rate, meaning 75% of the, the eggs that were laid hatched, the other 25% didn't, and they don't know why the other 25%. So there's actually some room here where we can hypothesize that maybe disease actually plays a role in the death of some of these eggs. Um, but we don't actually, we don't know. That's just a guess at this point. And so um, what I wanted to do and, and what I did uh, with my research was uh, I wanted to look at just the fusarium species uh, present in these Florida nesting sites. And so um, the diversity of the species there uh, I wanted to look at the possible presence and distribution of these two potential pathogens, FK and FF, uh, in nesting beaches uh, and associated with sea turtle nests in Florida. Are they there? Are they not there? Um, and if they are there, are they in the nests or not? Um, and then I wanted to look and see if there was an association between their presence and death. So if we found it in a nest, did that mean the nest was less likely to be successful? Um, did, did that have something to do with the death of some of these sea turtle eggs, especially in these areas where there's no mortality factors reported? And so, so these were some of the questions I was trying to answer. Um, in order to do that, I had to collaborate with a bunch of different uh, organizations and researchers. In fact, um, there are um, 28 national estuary and research reserve sites across uh, the United States. Three of them are found in Florida. These are run through NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and these are for research and education purposes um, and, and conservation purposes. 
And so uh, it just turns, it also turns out that much of the statewide beach surveys that they do are run out of these three uh, different uh, nurse sites as their like headquarters for those as well. So there are researchers there whose primary job it is to coordinate the volunteers to go out and, and monitor the nesting sites. So when volunteers go out, what they do is, is there are people out at the beginning of the season looking for uh, tracks that would indicate a sea turtle laid a nest. They actually dig up the nest and they count the number of eggs um, in the nest, replace the nest. And then um, it takes about 50 days for a sea turtle nest to hatch. And so at the, but they have it marked off when the 50 day point will be and they have, they actually mark off all these nests. So different beaches do it different ways, but some will put, and if you've ever been to a Florida beach during nesting season, I'm, you've, you've seen how they mark them off. Sometimes it's like caution tape around each nest. Sometimes it's a cage over top of each nest. It depends on where you are. Um, but after about 50 days, they'll be looking for signs of hatching, which actually you can see little flipper prints coming out from the hole where the nest was um, to indicate that hatching had occurred. Um, they will leave the nests for upwards of 70 days. So if they don't see, people go out every morning and check on these nests. And if they don't see hatching for 70 days, um, at about the 70 day point, they'll dig up the nests and see what happened. Um, and so a lot of times that's when we see some of our nests that were not successful, where there were a lot of dead eggs in the nests. Um, so I went out with volunteers and researchers who were digging up the nests and they were, what they were doing was counting the number of dead and the number that hatched. And they count the number of hatched based on the hatched eggshell fragments and the number of dead based on uh, how many whole eggs were still left over. And they can get basically a hatch success percentage. So if you have a hatch success percentage of 75%, it means 75 out of 100 eggs hatched successfully. And so um, I wanted to look at presence of fusarium species in correlation with that as well. And so I actually drove down um, to, to Apalachicola, uh, on the uh, Gulf Coast here by uh, St. George Island is where we went out and sampled. Then I drove down to Rookery Bay, um, which is down by Marco Island, down by Naples in Florida. Uh, and then I drove up to Guanatola Montanzas or GTM, which is uh, just around the St. Augustine area, just south of Jacksonville. And all of these are beautiful areas that I highly recommend visiting if you ever get a chance. Um, but uh, I, while I was there, I was able to go out and sample from sea turtle nests. I would swab eggs. And so this is kind of what, this is from Rookery Bay. Um, I was out uh, with these two researchers as they were digging in this, in the, to the nests, pulling out the eggs. And what they're doing is actually collecting data on whether or not the, the eggs hatched successfully. And so um, you can see a lot of, this was a pretty unsuccessful hatch. You can see a lot of these are whole eggs. So these are dead uh, eggs that never hatched. Um, and so once they pulled them out and did their counts, I would go in there with my swab and swab the eggs. And then I had Petri plates with media where I would put the swabs on. I also took sand samples from in the nest and outside the nest and put that on Petri dishes as well to grow out fungi and just see what kind of fusarium uh, species were there. So what were we looking at with some of our nests? Um, when you look at the eggs, uh, we saw quite a few different things. Um, and if you remember from the slide I showed um, at the beginning of this, I showed kind of some of the, the symptoms that people were identifying as associating with this. Um, we saw all sorts of things, including um, blackish colorations, yellowish colorations, kind of gray mats on the egg. Um, sometimes this pinkish blue, pinkish gray look to it as well. Um, and then sometimes you get, this is, this is actually, this bottom picture is an example of a 100% of a successful hatch. All you see are the eggshell fragments there, and they're all white and crisp. Um, and that tells me that there really was no microbial growth going on on there. I swabbed those as well to see if there was, in fact, fusarium on those. Um, but, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but this is generally what we saw. Um, and interestingly, and as I get into the results here, I'll talk more about this. Interestingly. Um, none of these symptoms really lined up with the presence of these fusarium species. So um, I don't think any of these are actual, you know, clear-cut symptoms of growth of these fungal species. There's lots of microorganisms that live in sandy environments. Um, of all these isolations, I isolated over 400 different fungal cultures, um, and about half of them turned out to be fusarium. And so there are a lot of other fungi out there too. And then there were a ton of bacteria as well that I was getting um, as well. So there's lots of microbes associated with these nests, associated with sand um, that could be playing some role in this as well. Um, so that could be anything that you see here. So, so on to the, the results. So 
I'm going to be talking about diversity at the species complex level here. So this Fusarium solani species complex I've been talking about, well, we went ahead and did that with every single Fusarium species, where like what was a morpho species is now a phylogenetic species with lots of other species within it that we can't tell apart. And so anytime you see something like F-I-E-S-C, F-F-S-C, it's just another species complex. Um, I didn't go much deeper than that because frankly, I didn't have the money to sequence all those Fusarians, so um, get their DNA sequence. But um, one of the things that really stood out is that at each site of all the Fusarium isolates that we got, the grand majority were within the Fusarium solani species complex. So that was our first clue that Keratoplasticum and Falciformi might be there, because remember, those two species are in the solani complex. But there are also 58 other species in the solani complex, so we don't know for sure based off this. Um, there were other species present, other species complexes present, but in, in much lower amounts. What was perhaps more interesting than that was comparing inside of the nest, so swabbing the eggs and taking sand samples inside of the nest versus outside of the nests, okay? So the top row you see here is um, this, this basically percentage of isolates in each, so, um, in each species complex uh, from inside of the nest at each site. So Apalachicola, 97% of the fusaria that I got from inside of the nest were in the Solani complex. Rookery Bay, 98% were in the Solani complex. GTM, 91% in the Solani complex. So over 90% Solani complex inside the nest for each one. But if you looked outside the nest, if you looked at the sand beyond the nest, okay, we, we were one to five meters away from the nest when we sampled, okay? There was a much greater diversity. In fact, these differences are statistically significant. Um, there, there were uh, a lot, a lot was a lot more diversity, especially in Apalachicola, and GTM, these are all just different species complexes in the different colors. Um, the white is always Fusarium solani species complex. So there were some solani species complex, but not nearly as much uh, when, when you look inside the nest. Um, and it kind of makes sense. It makes sense that one, one, if you look at the numbers, we got a lot more Fusarium from inside the nest at n equals 62. That's the number of Fusarium species from inside the Rookery Bay nests. Whereas outside, we only got 16 Fusarium species. There's a lot more nutrients inside the nest. I mean, sea turtle eggs are, are, are essentially um, large balls of nutrients for any kind of microorganism if they can break through the shell to get to. So um, it would make sense that you would find maybe more microorganisms associated with the eggs versus outside in, in, in the sand, which is more of kind of a desert-like condition with high UV, high heat, um, and, and a, lot, a lot less nutrients available. So what this image is showing um, is the breakdown of our FSSCs. So, so remember FSSC, Fusarium solani species complex. Fusarium keratoplascum, FK, and FF, Fusarium falciforme, made up all of the solani complex isolates that we found. So of, of the 60 potential solani complex isolates that you could find um, at any given point, the only two that we found were keratoplasticum and falciforme, okay? Um, and, and so, and this, this didn't change from inside the nest to outside the nest. So the first uh, graph here is just from inside the nest where we had, um, and the N number is just the number of Fusarium solani complex species. And you can actually see uh, here, blue is FK and orange is FF. So these were just all FK and FF across the board. Same thing outside the nest, the, the number of isolates were lower, just like I showed in the last figure, but um, FK and FF were the only two solani complex found. Um, uh, inside and outside the nest. Now, the other interesting thing was that I, I had swabbed dead eggs, but also hatched eggshells. So I wanted to know, was Fusarium keratoplasticum and Falciforme, were they associated with, with successful hatches as well? Because if this is a disease that's wiping through sea turtle nests, you would expect that where you find it, you find death, right? Well, that wasn't the case. In fact, um, if you look at uh, dead eggs, we found uh, overall about 70% of the time um, we found uh, Fusarium keratoplasticum or falciforme. Um, the other 30% of the time they weren't detected. So of all the dead eggs, 70% of them had keratoplasticum and falciforme. And if you look at hatched eggs, so successful hatches where clear, it was clear the hatchling got out and made it to the ocean, we're good, they're alive for now, it was about almost 30% of those hatched eggshells had keratoplasticum and falciforme associated with them. 70% did not. And so 
there's an argument to be made here that if we're finding uh, keratoplastic and phosphoformy on healthy hatched eggshells, it may not be wreaking the havoc as, as, a, disease, as, as a disease you would expect a disease to do uh, as much as, as is thought. Um, and the last figure here is looking at it compared to hatching success. And, and like I said, I wanted to, you know, look and say, hey, were keratoplastic and phosphoformy associated with negative or, or poor hatching success? And so because keratoplastic and phosphoformy were the only two Solani complex, we can just look at the FSSC as a whole. Um, and if you look at um, the hatch success, so the hatch success data I got from my colleagues in Florida for each nest, um, the darker boxes are positive for FSSC and the gray, light gray boxes are negative for FSSC. So um, for all the, all the nests that had zero to 20% hatch success, so a really low hatch success, um, they were all positive for FSSC. At least one keratoplasticum or falciformi was found in that nest, okay? Um, for 20 to 40% hatch success, we're, we only had, well, really across the board here in the middle, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80. We only, we only had one nest for each of those. So we don't have enough data there to really tell anything because there was only one nest that fell into each of those categories. Um, but perhaps what's more telling is if you look at the 80 to 100% success rate. 80 to 100% success means that most of the hatchlings survived. And even there, about eight out of the 11 nests that, we, that, we, that I swabbed had keratoplasticum or falciformi in it, even though they were successful. And so, so there's some questions that this brings up about, about you know, what kind of disease we might be dealing with here um, and, and you know, how, how dire uh, is this as a, as a disease. So just to kind of wrap up uh, this, we found that keratoplasticum and falciformia were both present at Florida sea turtle nesting sites. They're the only members of the Solani complex present at those sites. Um, there's a significant difference in the diversity of Fusarium species at the species complex level inside versus outside of the nests. And the FSSC, FK and FF, Keratoplastic and Fastiformi, dominated completely inside of the nests. Um, and then finally, the presence of FSSC isolates doesn't seem to be associated with hatching success, but we definitely need to sample more sea turtle nests. Um, to tell. And so um, that's how I'm trying to convince funding agencies to send me back to the Florida beaches to sample. Um, so we need more sampling to be done there. Um, this wraps up my talk. Uh, so, so these are just my acknowledgments. And I just wanted to also highlight um, uh, the only reason I was able to do this project, the sea turtle project, was because I was able to crowdfund it on experiment.com. And so you may be familiar with crowdfunding sites like GoFundMe and things like that. Um, there are actually crowdfunding sites that are dedicated strictly to science projects. Um, and so uh, experiment.com is one of those. Um, uh, and I, I highly re recommend looking it up. Uh, there's lots of cool projects out there, people looking for funding for. Um, and I was able to get the funding I needed to pay for uh, the, the field sampling equipment and, and uh, media for culturing and all that stuff that I needed to get down to Florida, drive around Florida um, and get back in Florida. And so. Um, with that, I will open up uh, if there's time for, for any questions. Yeah, there's plenty of time for questions, but let me just uh, start with uh, commending you for what was a rather esoteric subject delivered extremely well. I wish Thank that you. I had more college professors with your talent and ability uh, during my many times spent in many classes learning many things that I never really got as much as I got from this talk. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, yeah, uh, there were several people in the comments as you were talking going, this is fascinating. So, yeah. <laughs> so it, it definitely hit whatever nail it was on the head. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, questions uh, from among those who were participating. Um, so, there, there was one question um, in the comments. Um, Mitch had asked, are sea turtle eggs composed of keratin? That's a really great question, actually, um, because it, it ties into some, some directions I'm going with this research. Sea turtle eggs are actually, the, the shell of the egg is calcium carbonate. Um, and so uh, what's, what's really interesting to me is we're finding these two species, FK and FF, with the sea turtle eggs. Uh -oh. That are not in the nests. And the question is why? Why are these two species associated with the sea turtle eggs but not those other species. 
And I personally think, this is just a hypothesis, I, I think it might have something to do with the ability of these two species to get through that calcium carbonate shell. Some sort of chemical reaction, some sort of enzymatic production, something that these karate, the keratoplasticum and falciformi does might be able to break through um, that shell. And, and one, of the, one of the kind of things I run with as a, as a comparison, keratoplasticum, I told you, lives in the built environment. It lives in sink drains. Um, and, and if you live in an area like I do uh, with very hard water, you know you need to descale your Keurig and descale your teapot and descale everything because of the calcium buildup um, uh, from, from the water. And I'm wondering if it has something to do with the ability of these fungi to utilize or mobilize calcium um, and get it away from the eggshell so it can weaken the eggshell and get into the egg, maybe something like that. Um, but that's something that needs to be explored still with these fungi. So good question. Yeah, Rich had a question about the impact of climate change on the fungal diseases. And I was noticing that Rookery Bay, which is the southernmost site on your on your three sites, seemed to have a slightly different skew on some of the measures. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so so to address the, the climate change uh, question, yeah, so so sea turtles are are facing a barrage of other problems beyond you know fusarium diseases um, because of climate change. Um, one of the most notable things that I think shows some evidence that, that nests are being impacted by a changing climate is that um, sea turtles, uh, their sex ratios are determined by the temperature of their nest. And so the higher the temperature, so it's, it's around like the, the nice medium point is like, I think it's like 32 to 35 degrees Celsius, something in that range, um, where you get 50% male, 50% female hatchlings. Recently, um, hatchlings in, in many different locations. Um, and I think some in Australia beaches have been documented, and I think some Florida beaches as well. Um, the hatchlings are coming out 100% female, mm. um, which implies that the nests are getting warmer uh, during the hatching season. Um, and so, and that's coming from a, 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 warming, a warming climate. And then throw in things like um, sea, sea level rise. So I told you the shells of these, uh, of these um, Sea turtle nests or sea turtle eggs are made of calcium carbonate, but um, one of the you know stories behind um, sea level rise and well, it was really uh, at ocean acidification is that um, as the oceans acidify, the creatures that create their shells and structures out of calcium carbonate, like corals and things like that, um, are having a harder time because the acidified oceans are dissolving those shells. Well, calcium carbonate is what makes up the outside of a sea turtle shell. So if the sea levels are rising, meaning that you're seeing a a more frequent um, more frequent tidal inundation. So these sea turtle nests are being inundated with water more frequently, and that water happens to be more acidic on average. It's, it, it, I think it would be a, you know, a good bet that that might be impacting the structure and the overall you know, health of those sea turtle eggs inside of the nest. Um, and maybe that could be what gives way to microbial infections. Maybe that's what keratoplasticum and falciformi need to break through those eggs. And in some areas where they do see more mass mortalities associated with these fungi, maybe it has something to do with that. Um, but the thing about disease is that disease isn't just caused by a microbe. Disease is caused by a triad of things. It's caused by the pathogen being present, and it's caused by um, the environment being conducive to the pathogen's growth. But it's also caused by the or by the host, and the host being susceptible to the infection. If the host is, if you're no, if you're a fungus, and you're not able to break through the calcium carbonate shell. You're not going to be able to cause disease. If the host isn't susceptible. But if all of a sudden that shell is weakened, and you can break through, all of a sudden uh, disease can happen because uh, because of that change in the host susceptibility. Um, and I'm sorry, what was your second question, Elizabeth? Oh, I was noticing that Rookery Bay seemed to look different from the other two sites on some of your measures, and it just seemed like that could be core, that could be a prediction of what you might see with more climate change. Sure, and actually, just another interesting point to add. That's that's a really good observation, and actually, um, I, I think there's there's something there to that with regards to climate change. But another another uh, point to that is each of these beaches were very different, and so for example. Um, GTM was very much like the barrier islands you see on the east coast, like on the eastern shore, if you go down to Chincoteague, Astique, something like that. Very similar. Um, beaches, beach sand, things like that. When you go west, the same thing, Apalachicola, St. George Island, barrier island, same thing. Down in, in, in uh, Rookery Bay, I couldn't access the beach without getting on a boat. 
because all of the nests, or sorry, not the beaches, I couldn't access the nests without getting on a boat because all the nests were found on mangrove islands. And all of the, those islands were, it was just all crushed shell. There wasn't really much sand. And so it was all actually calcium carbonate. And if you notice at Rookery Bay, those, those differences were that we found more FSSC, more keratoplastic and more falciforme than we found other things even outside the nest. And that's another thing that kind of goes into my head regarding this hypothesis of it has something to do with the ability to use that calcium carbonate or get through that calcium carbonate that allows them to survive and do well inside the nest. But, but yeah, that was a good observation. A couple of people asked about whether you think that the turtles are contaminating the nest. Have people tested the, tur the turtles themselves for the Picerium species? Great question. Yes, there have been researchers that have gone out and actually um, swab sea turtles. And also, um, when, when and, and people get really up close and personal with sea turtles sometimes, um, people have gone out while the sea turtles are laying the eggs. Um, and swab, catch the eggs while they're being laid before they hit the sand, swab the eggs, oh. and also swab the cloacal fluid and plate it out to see what kind of microorganisms are there. And these species are not found uh, in, in associated with that. Um, and so, it, so that, was, that was a hypothesis that people had about this was, you know, is it something the sea turtles are introducing to the nests? Um, another hypothesis, because when we discovered that it was keratoplasticum, causing this problem, and we only knew keratoplasticum from the built environment. Another hypothesis was, that, is this a spillover? Are we talking about something that has adapted to the built environment that is now contaminating um, our natural environment and getting into our sea turtle nests? Um, which I have, I have other research that I've done on this with uh, more in-depth genetic data that shows us that no, that's not the case actually. These are native to beach environments, but, um, but I, won't, I won't get too much more in the nitty gritty on that. Um, there's a bunch of questions here. So Renee asked about um, whether Fusaria, that you talked about how they can produce fascinating colors when you grow them out, and, and she asked, are they ever used in pigments? And it sound like, sounds like Megan played around with that some when she was in graduate school. But have, have you, do you know anything about the pigments? And That's a good question. I've, I've not tried to use them for, for anything uh, pigment related. Um, but uh, you know, it's funny with Fusarium. Um, in, in the mycology world, especially in the plant pathology world, Fusarium's a bad word um, because Fusarium's a major plant pathogen and a human pathogen. And, and when you're dealing with it, you often have to have the, the permits required to do this and the appropriate uh, lab set up to do that and all this stuff, right? And so um, it's one of those things that probably hasn't kind of broken out um, in, into the world is like, hey, you know, maybe we can use this for pigment production because it often requires some specialized permitting and, and, and equipment to, to even work with some of these fusarium species because of their, because they're problematic plant pathogens and mycotoxin producers. I had a lot of problems because the ones I work with, excuse me, the um, Aquariorum, it's not a human pathogen. I've, I have evidence of that. Um, but it's also not a plant pathogen. I have evidence of that. But that didn't stop it from uh, taking about two months to get some of the isolates I, I got from a colleague in Hong Kong. Um, two months it sat at a USDA facility before it got to me um, to go through um, whatever it needed to go through to, to make sure it got to me because it, it was labeled as fusarium. Um, and, and my colleagues didn't put specifically what, what kind of fusarium. So that was I, I would just interject here that the fungus that uh, involves the wheat, that uh, it costs $5.6 billion and infects 20% uh, of all wheat is fusarium. Exactly, yeah, fusarium cremonierum. Um, and that's a uh, is that's called vomitoxin. Yeah, so it produces, it produces that, that's the mycotoxin that it produces right. um, that, that, can, that can make you sick and make uh, livestock sick. Uh, as well. Um, if you've heard of uh, the, the buzzword banana apocalypse um, thrown around, um, there's, a, there's a big problem um, right now in Central and South America with uh, a new strain of Fusarium oxysporum, uh, form of species Cubensi race 4, it's a mouthful, uh, but it's, it's, it causes Panama disease in bananas and wipes out bananas because bananas are produced in a monoculture. They're clonally propagated, meaning they're all genetically identical. So, so if there's no resistance in one, to the disease, there's no resistance resistance in any of them to the disease. That's addressed in the article. Yeah, yeah. And so and so and so fusarium um, is is scary uh, in a lot of ways. Different fusarium species can be very scary, uh, but then you have some that are. I mean, I wouldn't say the ones that I worked on were harmless, um, but they're not they're not uh, Panama disease causing or or uh, mycotoxin producing species. Um, so I didn't have that to be concerned about. 
So it's nine o'clock and I don't want to keep you or our participants too yeah, late, but you got multiple time. questions about white nose syndrome. Do you want to give just like the few sentence overview of some of the things you've been looking at and maybe things that people could look at if they want to know more about white nose? And one of the specific questions was, is it a worldwide issue? Yeah, absolutely. And so um, white nose syndrome uh, got me interested in fungi. Uh, apart from the PEC4, like I said earlier, I, I started doing research on white nose syndrome as an undergrad. Um, so, so white nose syndrome is worldwide in the sense that the fungus is found all over the world. That doesn't mean you necessarily see the disease. Um, what we have in North America is the introduction of this species, Pseudogenoascus destructans, in 2006, that it basically ripped through bat populations that had never seen this fungus before and, and caused mass die-offs. Um, research later on found that this fungus is present in, in uh, bat colonies in Europe and Asia, um, but it doesn't cause the mortality. It doesn't kill the bats there like it does here. Um, there's a lot of questions about why. Some of it's genetic, potentially, with the bats, immunity-wise. Some of it's behavioral. could be behavioral. Some of it could just be size. We see here in the United States, the bats that are heaviest impacted are the smaller ones, the little brown bats. The larger bats, they've been impacted, but it's not as bad as what you see with the little brown bats. And, and a lot of that has to do with how the fungus actually kills the bats. Um, we're not talking about um, something where the fungus itself is... It's hard to parse through this. It's, it is directly killing the bats, but it's also not. It's, it's sapping the nutrient reserves from hibernating bats and sapping out the water. And it causes the bats to wake up from torpor or hibernation in the middle of winter. And that is hugely energetically costly for bats to do. In fact, if you go out into a cave, which you can't do right now for a number of reasons, but um, if, you, if you were to take a bat off of roost doing research on bats and you took a, a bat that was hibernating and, and you tried to wake it up, it would take probably 20 to 30 minutes for that bat to actually come out of hibernation. Like it takes a lot of energy for them to do that. So not only do they have no nutrient reserves or water left over thanks to the fungus, but now they're using energy to wake up because they have to go get more nutrients. And in the dead of winter, you're not going to find any. You're not going to find any bugs flying around. You're not going to find any non-frozen water to drink. And that's what leads to the death of a lot of the bats. Um, and so there have been some behavioral differences that have been uh, noted between North American and European bats. For example, um, North American bats uh, roost in gigantic colonies where uh, a lot of different European bat species will actually roost in kind of smaller patchwork groupings. Um, and that can play a role in disease transmission itself. Um, so the, the fungus will spread really quickly through a colony of 10,000 bats. And in fact, in uh, early, I think 2010, 2011, um, when I was working on this, um, there was a cave in Bucks County, Pennsylvania that had a colony of like 10,000 little brown bats that in one winter was decimated to like less than 10 individual bats um, by this fungus. So it can, it can really rapidly rip through uh, a colony of bats close together. Um, a little bit about what, we're, uh, what I've done with white nose syndrome and what we're working on. So um, I've been working closely with both a colleague of mine and, and actually someone who I uh, who taught me mycology in my undergrad, Dr. Barry Overton at Lock Haven University, and he's been working with fish and wildlife as well as uh, researchers at Temple University uh, on a potential um, not cure but tr uh, environmental treatment, if you will, for caves and mines. Um, one of the tricky things about fungal diseases is that you can, if you can cure the animal, that's great. But fungi live in the environment. They don't require, these fungi don't require their host for survival. So if you cure a bat, when you find a bat, it's sick, you, you know, take it to a wildlife rehab, they cure the bat and then release it, that bat's gonna fly back into the cave and get reinfected, you know? So if you can't treat the environment, then you're not doing much, essentially, when it comes to protecting the bats. And so there's been a lot of research looking at that. Um, because all of that stuff that he's working on is proprietary, I can't give any information about what ex exactly it is that he's looking at. I actually don't know 100% what it is, to be honest. I know the acronym. But, <laughs> um, but um, another thing that he's been doing um, is describing new species of the fungus, uh, of the genus Pseudogenoascus, which is the genus of that fungus. And we don't know a lot about um, the other species in that genus. And so we've actually been working with undergraduate researchers. We put out two species descriptions um, in, the last, in the last year on two new species of Pseudogenoascus in the journal Fungal Planet. Um, which if, if you've never seen before, it's an open access. It's, you can just Google it. Um, it's put out by 
um, Pedro Kraus uh, and a couple of other uh, uh, mycologists, and, and they just publish a bunch of species descriptions, and they have lots, lots of really cool images of the different uh, fungi that they describe. Um, and I, I think on their website, they talk about they're, they're trying to put together some sort of uh, book or, uh, or something like that of, of just really interesting fungi um, all over the world. But that's kind of a side tangent. Um, anyway, that's where the picture I told you about uh, in the contagion um, uh, issue of Fungi Magazine on the front cover, that, that came from, one, that's one of those new species of Pseudogenoascus. Um, that's a confocal laser scanning microscopy image of its, of its uh, sexual structure um, that one of my students took. Um, and so, so yeah, it's, a, uh, uh, it's an interesting fungus, uh, a scary fungus for bats, uh, and it's uh, an interesting group of fungi as far as the genus is concerned. Um, any other specific questions I can answer about, about white nose syndrome? I'm happy to do so. They were more general requests to hear what you had been working on, so that was great. Um, I think the last one I'll hit on is just um, folks are asking if, if um, there's a place where they can learn more about your research. Do you have a website where you have things sort of collected, or and is there a way to follow what you do in the future? Absolutely. Um, and so my my I have a website. Um, I, I will warn you parts of it are kind of a construction website. <laughs> so it's not quite fully, fully completed, but it's, it's, it's pretty much there. Um, and the website is, is smithmycology.com. Um, Smith is spelled with a Y. Um, and I'll just, I'll see if I can just type it into the chat box here, actually. Um, let's see if this- If you just send it to Tom, uh, we can just include it probably in the uh, after notes. Sure, yeah, I can do that. More effective sure. probably. Um, Oh, it looks like it looks like um, Tom already found it here. Oh, he did. There we I'll go. Just... <laughs> yeah, and so um, I have I have uh, all the information um, about you know what I'm doing. Well, semi currently, I'm kind of in the process of moving places, so it'll be updated hopefully in the near future. Um, but on there, if you ever have, I'm I'm happy to answer questions about you know anything fungal related, of course. Um, so you know my my email addresses are listed there. Um, the Lockhaven email address will expire soon as I leave Lockhaven, but the Gmail address will will be forever persistent. So um, from place to place, um, but they're both listed on that homepage there. So um, if people have questions, anything like that, always free to uh, reach out. I'm happy to 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 answer them. Excellent. Well, okay. thank you so much. I think that, uh, yes, thank you very much, Chris, for that was a wonderful presentation on a subject that I don't think we have ever heard even once, one bit of in the 15 years that I've been involved with this, 20 years actually. So with that, uh, I don't think there's too much we can add to uh, the quality of that particular approach to what we might do in the future. So I guess uh, we're gonna sign off uh, for the June Zoom. And uh, thank you all for participating. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, and there'll be a recap that'll come out in a couple of days with the science article and perhaps uh, Christopher's website and whether else Tom can cook up, which he always does quite well uh, to inform us of what's going on today and in the future. And with that, I, I bid you all uh, and to each other, good night, 